We've got two of the three at least. Yeah. All right, we are recording now. Okay. Take it away, David Owen. Okay, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna move back and give you some space here. Okay, so I didn't really hear much excitement about anything. So, um, how about we do, is this where I pick the most unpopular ones, make everyone revolt and tell me what they really want to hear? All right, who has an IDE that they could show today? I can show one. Okay, what ID do you have, Dave? Wing. What do you have? It's just a line. Okay, let's do IDEs. Okay. Let's start. Okay, I hope this works. Except I can't show because I'm presenting. You can share your I'm screen. Tied up. I guess I could do that, maybe. That's what you have to Yeah, okay. you're right. All right, just share the ads. Okay, so I use Emacs for my IDE, and um, I actually started with Vim, and it took me a long time to convert to Emacs. Partly because it's really painful to learn how to use Emacs. But once you get to using it, it's actually really nice. So I think the biggest thing, that if you use Emacs uh, as an IDE, is you want to go and install a package called ECB. Uh, e ECB. And um, the thing to know is all about Emacs packages. So got a couple of different repositories of Emacs packages. The first one is called Marmalade, and um, there's another one called Melfa. Oops. Okay, that worked. So when you go to them, they will show you how to add it into the Emacs config. So it shows you what you need to add to your .emacs file right there. And same thing for Marmalade. And when you're on the website, you can browse the packages, search for them. Uh, for example, you can search for Git and see all of these plugins that have anything to do with Git, and uh, how many downloads they have, and what the latest version is and stuff. So once you add your um, repositories to Emacs, you come in here and you run the list packages command. So a couple of things. The first one is that And then it will list out all the packages that are available in any repository that you have. And then you can search in the buffer for your packages. And notice here for ECB, for example, um, there are a few li listed. You've got one that's at version 2.24, and that's from Melpa Stable. Um, 2.40 is from Marmalade, and then ECB Snapshot is also from Marmalade. So you can pick which one you want. I always pick a stable one that says Snapshot. So we press I to mark it for installation, and then X to execute what you've marked. Um, I've already got it installed, so I'm going to forego that. When you install a package, it will also figure out what dependencies that package has and install those as well. So once you've got all of your packages installed and set up, you can type ECB activate, and that will load up everything that it needs, and it will give you some managed Emacs windows. So what you might call tabs or panes in other editors, these four sections, they're all called um, Windows in Emacs, and normally when uh, when you move between windows, Emacs will treat every window the same. So your your navigation commands for moving back and forth kind of get lost between which one's your directory, which one is 
uh, your method browser and which one is your source file, but ECB manages them for you so that you've got some commands uh, that will navigate them. Let me pull them up here. So here are some ECB commands. Um, Emacs syntax, the, the capital C dash, that means hold down control and then press the following key. So that's control C, followed by a period, followed by the lowercase g, followed by a one, and then that will take you to your first edit window, or your second editor, uh, edit window, or you can go to your directories or your sources window. So this is your directories window right there. Those are your sources. This is your method browser, and this is your history window. So let's see if I can pull a project up and kind of show you what this looks like. So this is a project that I have in Python, and I'm using the keyboard to do all my navigation right now. And as you navigate into a source file, um, it will update other windows to match it. We go to a different file here, something a little more recent. So when I come into views, and this is a Django app here, um, there's another plugin. It's called Semantic for Emacs, and it goes through your source file and analyzes it for all of the, the semantically significant things. So uh, a top level class, my import statements, top level methods. And then it all lists everything out here in the, the method browser in a nice organized way. So I can look at, for example, my handler class is right there. I can see what its parents are, what its methods are. If I press enter on anything, it jumps to it and highlights it. Um, I can go to anything to navigate to it quickly. Like that. So that's the um, How about doc streams. Doc streams. Um, I don't know. Let's see. I'm just curious if, if when you then type the function dismiss somewhere, if it would give you the doc string. Oh, for like. Like if you're editing like now. Completion mode or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Emacs doesn't. I, I haven't installed any plugins that do completion. Normally, you just have word completion. So you hit Alt I, um, Alt slash, and it will try to complete what you've already typed based on other words that it sees in your current buffer, and then other buffers, and it will just cycle through everything, mm -hmm. which is usually good enough. But it's not context sensitive. Okay. I'm sure there's a plugin somewhere for that. Though. Um. Questions about Emacs for an IDE? Because I'm not sure what people would want to know about because it's Emacs, it's weird. Yeah. The question I have is why. <laughs> well, why Emacs? Okay. Well, that, that's but I'm afraid if I ask that, you won't answer it. No, yeah, well, <laughs> now I am going to answer it. So. Um, See if I can come up with a good example. Just a moment. Well, I'll give you another question while you're doing that. Um, I've always liked uh, my IDE, like .NET, that actually shows you the values of values stepping through while you're debugging. And which of the IDEs will do that? Yeah, it will. Okay, which one? Wing. Wing. I believe you can get Max to do it with GDB also. Yeah. Oh, it's a set through code. Mm -hmm. That's to show the value of it. Or you watch how the values of the content. That's what I was going to say as far as why you'd want to use Emacs is if you're used to the environment and you've got GDB already ingrained into your bloodstream. Uh, it would be a way to continue on. It's not bad. <laughs> Depends 
on which way you lean, I guess. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so here's an example of one reason I love Emacs. So I've got some data here, and it's in a semi-structured format. Now let's say that I want to bring this into my code. For some reason, let, let's just say, you know, I got this from an external source, and I want to make some, like, a dictionary or a list of lists for this. So, oh, there is something wrong. something wrong with Ubuntu. It won't let me do the normal cut and paste stuff. Let's see. There we go. <coughs> All right. All right. So here's my semi-structured data. I'm going to hit F3 to start recording the macro. And then I'm going to use my normal Emacs keyboard shortcuts to navigate, close up space, delete things. So um, let's say, first off, I want to uh, close up my space. And then I'm going to start uh, an array and string, jump forward a word, close the string, comma, close up my space, delete that, close up my space again, forward, forward that comma right arrow and then I press F4 to finish recording and now I can hit F4 multiple times to repeat that sequence of steps to that and now all my data is like 90% of the way into Python format so there we go so that's one thing I like about Emacs it's uh, and, and because it has a variety of navigation commands, and other editors do too, like uh, you can jump by word, um, it, it, you can jump by word according to like breaking characters, like underscores, or you can jump over them for like programming symbols. You can jump by lines, <coughs> by paragraphs. Um, if your programming mode, like um, right now I'm in Python mode. If your programming mode adds support for it, you can jump by method definitions and class definitions. So you can navigate a file really quickly. Um, it has kind of a, a crude form of code folding. Um, if I say I want to code fold anything that's less than uh, column four or greater than column four away, I can do that, and now I'm just kind of looking at a top level view of my file where I can open it up a little bit and navigate at that level. And as I'm cursoring down, it's taking me across visible lines and skipping over any line that's not visible. So it's a quick way to navigate. questions about Emacs. Okay. We're done with Emacs. Good? Okay. Dave has more questions. He's not convinced, but he'll ask them later. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'll ask that question. <laughs> How well does it work over XF? Oh, um, it works very well. It's pretty efficient with the way it draws things. Over what? X11. It's not all of those things. <laughs> Sorry. It's so you have when you have to work on a remote machine, but you are wanting to use editors and tools on yours. We have Eclipse right now that we use. And it is oh, that's very slow. That would be painful. very slow because it renders everything as pixels and then sends pix buffs over the network. Right. Emacs uses your toolkit and it has a lot less bling on the interface, no gradients and stuff like that. So it's a lot faster. Um, also, if you're in a pinch on a remote system that is really suffering for bandwidth, you can pass it the no window option. And then it will run in just your terminal. Yeah. But it will give you every feature that it still has. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, cool. Yeah. So you yeah, really? that's very nice. And, and you. you you might remember that even in the, the graphics mode, that was a folder icon. 
you know, a little graphic, and here it's rendering it in text mode with something that makes sense. And I'm using my keyboard to navigate everything anyway, so everything still works. But um, <coughs> if you have the except for your mouse, no, if you have the GPM mouse driver set up, you can still mouse in this. Sublime is it's just a text editor, so it's like Notepad++ <laughs> in a sense, right? So it's very lightweight, <coughs> it's a little bit prettier than Notepad++. Um, the one reason I use Sublime mostly is it allows me to, there's a plugin that allows me to do SFTP, so I can have a remote folder set up and sync between it. I think you have a straight back tick in the line 17. Yeah, I probably accidentally did that. And that's the other great thing, is there are all kinds of plugins you can use. One is called Sublime Linter, and you can literally find linters for anything you want. So I have a JSON PEP8 installed, um, that one, whatever that is, PyLink. Usually I have a PEP, usually I have a PEP257 in there too, but it's probably not installed for whatever reasons it's going on right now. But that's the one that will tell you syntax highlighting, right? And then PEP8 would be. Especially for a new new programmer, I like it because you don't have to you don't get confused by all the other IDE things that exist. You can literally just if you don't have the doc stream there. Hey, doc stream. So it's got your pep eights in there. It'll uh, you can do some syntax. It'll so do syntax highlighting. It'll do all this stuff. Will you go back to that where it had that warning? Um, show us how you find out what the warnings are. You also I might want to. Well, you so also might want to back up a step. You've got two guys in here that probably don't even know what Pep Eight is. <laughs> so two, three. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, <coughs> ask your question real quick, Dave. Um, it shows you the things here that the issues to see what the, the actual problem is. It just lists it down at the bottom. Oh. Okay. So this is saying that the balance attacks on that line. The other one it was saying. And no docs to be included. The other one was a warning icon, yeah. too. Yeah, so it was a like warning icon. And there's all kinds of different icon sets you can get for things. So, PEP 8 standards are Python programming standards. Um, really Mostly style. Style. There are guidelines that some people treat as rules. Right. <laughs> so it just prompts you when you, when you uh, not met right. So lines. because I have that that linter installed, that Pep8 linter installed, it's going to tell me when I have things that are going to go against the Pep8 series. So, probably, probably this probably the problem too. Does detect the the two spaces that are right? Like, technically. <laughs> anyway. Um, but it's really lightweight, easy to use. There are some more advanced plugins you can get that will allow you to run the Python, do it, run it here with debugging and stuff like that. I don't do that because, like I said, I'm running on a web server anyway. So I save my code, it syncs it, and then I execute it on a different platform. But I just like it because it's lightweight and it's a little bit prettier than Notepad Plus Plus. And it's the plugins I find are really easy. Through, uh, through the That's a nice ringer face. <coughs> to 
and salt packages. Yeah, so Highlander. So now that I'm not in the hot seat and thinking of more things, um, Emacs also does the, the little warning things using a plugin called Flycheck. And then it can call out to um, Flake, Flake 8, PyWind, or maybe some others as well. And you can configure them however. How do you um, tell Sublime? Are you not sharing your screen? I don't think you're sharing your screen. I just looked over. After all this, <laughs> start sharing now. I can see the Nurgler. The three dots at the top right. Sure. There you go. That's better. So how do you tell Sublime where your project is rooted at? Does that make sense? Like how you add a project here? Yeah. That to me just looks like a folder structure. That is not a project. There's no project. So it doesn't have a solution file or a project file or anything like that. So any like if I was to use Git or something like that, I would handle that on command. So this makes sense. If you go, if you go to the, I don't have a shared, but if you go to the, the console here, I can go there and you can see that Git and stuff in there. But it's not, it's hiding that. So at the top level, it has that source folder. Is that, that is an actual just, folder? That's a folder I've created in my problem that I'll there. Oh, okay. So it's only showing source and everything. I don't think I have my SFT stuff set up. So he's probably sticking everything in one project. Because if you see, I mean, there's a there's a menu option for project. Yeah, so I can, so I basically, if I wanted to map a remote directory, I could map it with this plugin, with this, this plugin, and it's basically a JSON file that describes the login information, how to sync it, what files to take in order to sync, stuff like that. So in that case, I would ignore all the Git stuff. So sort of bizarre that that doesn't show up on the stream. <laughs> oh, the pop your pop-up does not show up on the sh on the share. It's because it's just sharing Sublime and those are probably different windows. Oh, yeah. processes it's trying. That's exactly where it is. It's deep in Python. Uh, processes probably. Anyway. But yeah, so it's a really easy one to get into without all your bells and whistles. I've always found like PyCharm. I've used PyCharm and it's too hard to get going. <laughs> where do you get Sublime? Sublime's free. Well, it's not. It's free, but every once in a while it pop up saying buy it, you just hit cancel. They, <laughs> the, people who, the people who make it know this, and that's what they do. It's the community edition, and it's just pop up every once in a while. The SFTB plugin actually is also the same way, so we'll have an official one for that one. I have a question. It's not actually IDE related, it's more Python. <coughs> I guess the, the doc strings you have here, yes, yes. I assume that's used to format uh, the documentation for what you're doing. How is that? Is that what that's all about? Or is that just a Yeah, so yeah. he's fallen in. He's fallen to the, is it PEP257 that talks about doc strings, or is it? Yes. Maybe? I think it's PEP257 standards. I think it's, I think, honestly, I think it's both. They might have some of both. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's always a, there's always one for the beginning of your project that mm -hmm. describes your project. And then for every class, there'll be one. Every function definition, there'll be one that describes its use. And these ones aren't very descriptive, but be like, it can be. They're required? Uh, it's required for the, for the formatting the standards. Yeah. So not, not for Python execution. The interpreter doesn't care about that stuff. But that's not used to automatically create documentation for what you're written. You can. Yeah, can. You could if you wanted. There, like, are, there are applications that will read your source code and turn that into an HTML help file right, or something like right. that. Sure. Um, me personally, I use the doc strings and the, and the function doc strings and stuff to help me as I'm writing code to remember in you know human words mm -hmm. what the function is going to try and accomplish, what the return value might be. And my IDE 
as I'm typing out a function, it'll read ahead into the code and it'll feed me my doc string so that as I'm using the function, I can remember what the function is going to try and accomplish for me. So it's a, it's a comment on steroids. Yes. Have you ever, Java has a similar, I don't know if they call it doc strings or the no, I'm more familiar with the doc. Okay. But it's the three, three slashes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same principle ideas. I don't have it. My Pepe linter will tell me I don't have it. How often does it nag you? For everything that's not following the standards. No, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the uh, Sublime uh, owners. Oh, oh, oh. Um, have you seen it yet? Not yet. No. Yeah, so, it's not too bad. It's like, it usually does that on saves. So, like, I think every 20 is saved, maybe, or something. Not that expensive. $70, $70, 70 per $70. user, and it's good for as many Any machines you want. Yeah. Yeah. So, relatively like, you're looking for a, if you're looking for a good plain text editor that can also do some you know, highlighting and linting, it's a good option. Yeah. Or the add-ons also charged by those who write them? No, some yeah. of them can, but they don't. Most of them are all free and open source. And they all have projects on GitHub and stuff like that for it. And I basically went with just milk that plus plus for several months and just simple coding and getting ready and does have a couple of add-ins in there that will help with the So if you're really just starting out and don't want to learn something new. Well, yeah, I've, I've seen, I haven't looked at much of Sublime, but uh, I, I was poking around in a spare moment today at work and realized that Visual Studio 2015 had some Python uh, add-ons. Right. I didn't really have much chance to do it. Yeah, I, I played with them for a little bit. Uh, the ones that for the you just see this and they seemed okay. I don't know if anybody who actually uses them. <laughs> Microsoft seems to be doing well, that. Yeah, source. right. You know, it's like dealing with the devil. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. Okay. All right. Ooh, you want to know about Wing? I'm going to try and do it this way. Let's see. So first, position this window here. And then I'm going to come into my share. that work? There you are. So uh, this is this is Wing IDE. Mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, gosh, I can't really look up there. I've got some artifacting going on or something. And it's lagging. It's really laggy. Um, typically when I program, I program two windows side by side. You can't really quite see that um, here. If I, if I reduce the font size, you can kind of see what, what I what I do, try and do. One of the PEP standards uh, has to do with um, characters per line, and so for the most part, I have I have this uh, line set up here, telling me when I've reach the end of, of what uh, what that what that limit should be and when I should be carrying on to the next line. Um, so that, that's why my, my IDE was originally set up as two side by side windows. Um, I also tend to tend to program like that anyway so that I can uh, so that I can see uh, uh, files that I'm working with and stuff like that. Um, <coughs> uh, like if I'm calling a calling a method from a different a different module or something. Um, generally speaking, what you see in the upper right-hand corner here, this is our, uh, uh, this is your project, um, and uh, I can uh, execute something from the project, 
just by right click by I can right click on it and then say that I want to debug um, that thing except for you're not getting that window because I'm apparently not sharing it but I can hit debug selected and it would give me a, a window with with options let me try uh, sharing other things let's see what happens Just if I do this, that's gonna be really screwy, isn't it? Because I've got two windows. Yeah, you're only seeing one of them. No, it's not gonna work. All right. Uh, it. Needless to say, when I when I uh, right click on that file over there on the right side, I do get a pop-up window that gives me options of executing it, um, executing that particular file. I can uh, set breakpoints in my code um, just by clicking on them, and then when I debug those those when I debug my application, it'll stop on those breakpoints. And uh, when it does, I can see some stack data down there. I can't remember who was asking about that. Um, but I, ca I can see that I can see what the what the current stack looks like. I can also come over here and look at the call stack. Um, so I mean, I, and I can even demo what what that is what that is like. Um, let's just go to somewhere inside of the application. Um, A long time since I've run this one, so so it when I executed it, um, it got to this point here where I've got my breakpoint. Um, it's telling me right here this is what my call stack looks like up to that point. So you can see I'm you know about seven seven methods deep. I can click on any one of these and jump to exactly where that is in the in the call stack. I can also inspect in any of the uh, current state of any of the variables at this point in the code, um, lo local variables and global variables. Um, I can also, I have a debug probe, so I can execute code in the, Py the Python interpreter context that's running inside my application at the current level of the call stack. So, uh, for instance, if I wanted to know something a little bit about this presentation variable that, that came in here, um, I could, uh, I can type that in here, and it would tell me, it would, you know, give me a, give me a representation of what that variable looks like. Um, <coughs> I could also change that variable if I wanted to, and then if I resume, um, by either hitting this play button up here or stepping through my code, um, then any changes that I had made in that debug probe um, would have taken effect uh, into the current context. So that's really helpful as far as I'm concerned uh, when I'm when I'm you know have when I have a complicated application. I was going to point it at you. <laughs> See, you want me to do something like this? I can even get to that window. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> right, right there. See that? Now, uh, so if I'm, uh, you know, debugging through my application, um, I can, I can understand what's going on, what certain variables are set to, uh, stuff like that. Um, uh, other, other benefits and and things that I that I really like about it. Um, there's a source browser, kind of like what you were saying, uh, Dave and Emacs, how it kind of inspects your code and pulls out the the important things and it shows them to you. Um, you know, so this this module has these classes and this, this class has these methods. Um, I can also uh, edit through the existing file using this this drop down here. So I'm going to go to the main control class 
these are all the methods within that thing. I can jump to those. Um, I can code fold, um, and there's key keyboard shortcuts if I wanted to play that game too. Um, uh, I have never done anything with snippets. Um, pull this down a little bit. Refactoring, I use I use that quite a bit. If I've got some code in here that is using, I don't know, it's wrong wrong case for for Python syntax kind of stuff, or wrong, you know, camel case variables or something. Um, um, So if I had something like that, I could right click on this guy. You're not gonna see that, but then I can, I have a refactor menu and I can say rename symbol. And then it's going to find all of the instances of that symbol um, for for that, within that function, or if that happened to be a, a parameter in the function, uh, function call, it would find all of the places where that thing is called as a keyword argument. And, uh, and I can type in the new name here something like that and then just it'll rename it for me in all of the right places. Um, so there's quite a bit of, of very very cool uh, helps there for refactoring code. Um, I could have just as easily uh, highlighted highlighted a section of code and said extract this thing into its own method and let's say we want to call it uh, setting up variable setting up var, I hit extract, and it's going to create a method, it's going to realize that, that that variable is used on the next line, and so it's going to return it, pass in whatever appropriate uh, methods it needs to. Um, so I find that pretty helpful. Uh, it will also introduce a variable, so let's say if I have something, uh, I don't know, um, so my variable equals five, and then later on I say, um, uh, where, where would I, how would I, where would I do this? Um, uh, let's say that I, well, in fact, right here, display about box. Um, if, for instance, this method returned some sort of function, or it, may, or, I'm sorry, returned some sort of value, um, and then I was going to, I don't know, add five to whatever that was. Um, if I wanted to turn that, and I was doing that maybe several places, I can now refactor that and I can say introduce that as a, into a variable. I want to call that variable my var. It will um, take whatever I'd highlighted, save that as a variable, and then any time that I was using that same method or that same whatever I had highlighted throughout my function, it will replace the content of that with with whatever I named it there. So I mean, it's kind of a cheesy example that I just gave, but I think it kind of makes the point. Um, there's a uh, PyLint uh, as well. I can just right click and say update for main control. It'll go through main control, uh, find all my errors, warnings, uh, info and then it can give me feedback. You know, comparison to none should be expression is none. So I could change change this. To to more Python appropriate syntax. Um, telling me that I'm missing some method doc strings, you know, stuff like that. So I can get feedback on all that kind of stuff. Um, I mentioned earlier that there that it would handle uh, uh, doc strings. So if there was a doc string here, um, updates the ward name um, internally. I don't know whatever that method did. If there was somewhere else that I was using that, I have this uh, source assistant. Um, you can see that I'm part of that that method here, and this is the the PEP 287 doc string for that. So now if I'm over here and I say self dot update ward name, it's going to load that bottom right hand window with 
with uh, information about that. If I put a left parenthesis, it's now going to prompt me with what variable that, that function call is going to be expecting. So, so I find that super helpful. Um, I do have an in, uh, embedded Python shell, so I can just not not in any context of any application. It's just a straight up interpreter window. I can set watch variables. Uh, I've never done anything with modules. Um, and I haven't done anything with bookmarks. I can run OS commands straight from here. Over here, I, I use search quite quite often, particularly uh, within my package, um, or within, within my project. I have a filter, uh, my Python files, my files, and Python files. Um, oh, you can't see that, can you? But I, I can change this filter and within the context of my project, I can get different search results back. So if I'm editing, for instance, an HTML template document, and I'm looking for text within that template, um, I can tell it to only search HTML files, or only search Python files, or only search files within a certain tree or whatever. Um, search is just for searching within, within the current file. Stack data, I've already shown you guys that. Um, <coughs> exceptions, if it catches any exceptions, uh, it will show me uh, information about that here. I can see all of the breakpoints within my project there, and then I can set conditions as to when those breakpoints are going to uh, um, to fire and tri trigger the debugger to stop. And then there's a testing tab here. So if I was writing unit tests like a good Python developer, I would actually see all of those unit tests listed here. Um, and I have done that, um, and so, I, so I know what the behavior is. Um, but all the tests there, and then I can run the tests individually just by clicking on them, or I can run the whole suite by clicking run tests. Um, so there's there's Wing. I don't know if you have any questions on that or if that kind of open source shareware. Uh, it's commercial. Commercial uh, a uh, a non-commercial license. I want to say is uh, eighty dollars, um, and that covers that covers uh, all of the updates for like a year. And then if you want updates beyond that, you have to pay like their eighty eighty dollar. Um, whatever their eighty dollar support support yeah, yeah. Um, if you're going to be using it to write um, commercial code uh, I think something like two hundred dollars um, for the commercial license yeah I'm sorry I should have taken that this time before I came over I had sorry. trouble anyway so there's wing any others. Awesome. This, this uh, you know, you're using Ubuntu and you're using Windows. Apparently, mm -hmm. Python works pretty well. And uh -huh. any yeah, um, and and I have installed Wing on Mac mm -hmm. and on Ubuntu, and the the IDE itself is is the same. Um, Python is is for the most part operating system independent. There are certain libraries that, that lean on. Uh, Operating system dependent things, um, and so you know you run into that, you know here and there. But for the most part, if you stick with the standard library, if you if you're careful about your packages, then then a, a, an application written on on one operating system can run can execute just fine on, on any others. Any other demos we want to see? We want to pick an AI challenge. <laughs> Whoa, people religion keep, wars. People keep talking about it, Dave says. I think it's been mostly him. It's been mostly <laughs> you. <laughs> it's been mostly the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> Who's in charge? We're done. Should I stop? Yeah. This? Stop the recording.